Um, yeah. We would like to present a little bit this project, which uh, it's it's still open, and um, uh, I was wor I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, somehow I don't know a little bit by chance, and you you will not you will notice why uh, during the last uh, seven eight years. But uh, I think uh, a part of the some kind of fetishism that can. Uh, we, have, we can find behind this sound itself that you will listen during the lecture. I think it, it um, it's very useful to 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 understand uh, a lot of different things, cultural situations and realities about how we manage uh, with sound and with uh, with noise. In fact, uh, one of the biggest things that I found in this research is that uh, probably this is one of the most the oldest uh, sounds, non-musical, non-strictly musical sounds of the humanity. Uh, so, uh, some it's probable that uh, uh, maybe some of you you never heard this sound, but reminds you something else. Well, in 1880, and this is the beginning of of my story and my research. The famous romantic writer Victor Hugo wrote one of the most interesting texts ever written about the Basque Country. It was called Alps and Pyrenees. He could find a better title, obviously, but for some reason, I imagine mainly commercial, in an era when travel books were real bestsellers, he kept that literal title of this book. 200 years later, when the Basque writer Koldo Isaguirre received the commission to translate for the very first time that book to Basque language, he changed the original title to Idi Orgaren Carranca, which means the squeaking sound of an ox cart. Look at how, how different this is the title of one from, to the other. The main reason for such a radical change in the title becomes clear in the first uh, part of the original travel book. The book is written in the 19th century travel diary style, paying special attention to sounds, where Hugo describes the French land from Bordeaux to Endai, and then, let's say, the Basque land from Endai, France, to San Sebastian, Spain. In fact, he lived there for some time. But there is one text, probably the briefest chapter of the book, which just doesn't fit at all with the overall tone of the book. It describes the exact moment with the diligence driving him, among other tourists, crosses the border with Spain in the Basque Country. And it says, between Bidart and saint jean de Luz, at the door of a poor inn, I saw an old Spanish ox cart. By that, I mean the little cart of Biscay, with two oxen and two full wheels, turning with the axle and making a terrible noise that can be heard from a yard, even into the mountains. I was very small when I crossed these mountains and when I heard it for the first time. The other day, as soon as it hit my ear, just hearing it, I felt suddenly rejuvenated. It seemed to me that all my childhood revived in me. As the Oxford approached with its wild music, I distinctly saw this beautiful past, and it seemed to me that between this past and today, there was nothing. It was yesterday. The travelers around me were covering their ears. My heart was raptured. Never a Weber squire, a Beethoven symphony, neither a melody composed by Mozart touched my soul as this angelic and ineffable ox cart and its furious grinding, provoked by this two badly greased wheels in a stone path. Um, for me, uh, to me, when, when the first time I read this text, I was just surprised. This guy, guy, let's say Victor Hugo, was talking about. Uh, my own country, and I couldn't recognize this kind of strange noise he was talking about and uh, how, how he excited this. Then I found that part of this excitation of Victor Hugo was that when he was a child, he was a son of a, uh, Napoleon's uh, uh, military chief boss. And he, when he was three or four years old, he came to the Basque Country for holidays. It looks like he heard that sound. And just 50 or 60 years later, he heard it again. But he was not the only one. Um, almost a century before, one of the most important intellectuals of Europe, Wilhelm von Humboldt, advised about this sound during a field trip to study the Basque society. He said, 
the impression of being in a foreign country was renewed at our first step through Gipuzkoa by a singular noise that surprises the traveler before getting used to it. I am referring to the screeching noise of the ox carts that we find at every step. The wheels of these cars are complete discs without radial separation, and instead of rotating on the axle, the wheels rotate with the axle. This causes a screeching and penetrating noise that heard especially at the fall of the evening and from afar without being seen produces a singularly sad and oppressive impression. There is not any ox cart alive, I mean, sounding in Spain anymore. Even in Portugal, it's very, very difficult to find. The only place I found one of these ox carts making its own sound was in uh, Azores Island. The German traveler and writer Frederick Augustus Fischer also wrote about this sound on his travels in Spain in 1797 and 1798. And says, soon after quitting Bilboa, I was surrounded by mountains, but a veiled number of loaded mules and a long train of carts drawn by oxen gave animation to the scene. So it is true that at first the creaking of these carriages was extremely disagreeable, it not being the custom here to grease the wheels. Three decades later, Scottish journalist and Hispanist Harry D. B. English, also known as Derwent Conway, 
writes down an extensive comment about this mysterious noise, comparing it before Hugo with music and trying to know what can create such a loud noise and why. There is another sort of a peculiar music to Biscay, of the most discordant kind, and which I cannot recollect even now without unpleasant sensations. This music is produced by the wheels of the cart drawn by oxen. These are solid, without spokes, and a strong wooden screw is made to press upon the axle of the wheel. The consequences of this it is, is a sound so horribly grating that the faintest conception of it cannot be conveyed by words. Okay. Go on. The peasants about in English feeling well with this sound, and he offers even more more uh, relations and uh, connect with sound with urbanism, citizens, laws, acoustic pollution, etc. The peasant supposes that without this noise, the oxen would not go willingly, and if they be once accustomed uh, to it, this may perhaps be true. No carriage being allowed to pass along the streets of Bilbao, they are of course free from this intolerable nuisance. In the town of Orduña also it is not permitted, but on all the roads of the Basque provinces, especially in the streets of Vitoria, this noise is so unintermittent that nothing could tempt it to reside in that town. I must say that the Bilbao, the, uh, uh, the prohibition of, uh, of these ox carts uh, came in, in 1934. And, um, and there are a lot of uh, stories, I found uh, stories written in, in newspapers. Uh, they were telling that some of the Oscar drivers were going uh, to the city knowing that it was not permitted, so they were paying the penalty before just to make their own noise. So they were so proud about it. No? Let's go. 1945. Voyage in Spain to a Fille Gautier, French poet, playwright, and art critic. I think it's obvious on the text. A strange, inexplicable, loud noise, which at the same time was frightening and ridiculous, warned my ear in a moment. It seemed a multitude of jays, a group of whipped children, cats in head, scissors of annoying teeth on a hard stone that scraped pots. Wow. Rusty prison kings fought to free their prisoner. I thought that at least she was a princess sacrificed by a fierce negromante. But it was no more than a bullock cart out the street of Irun. The driver probably preferred to leave the fat to make soup. This car was undoubtedly primitive. The wheels were compact and fit with the axle, like the little cars that children ride with pumpkin bark. This noise is heard as, as from a half a yard, but does not seem to bother the, native, the natives. They have, then, a musical instrument that costs nothing and reproduces by itself, since the row is difficult. They see it as harmonious as the exercise of a violinist on the fourth string. A farmer would not want a not singing cart. This vehicle must be from the pre-Diluvian era. And follows. We arrive at Mondragon, the last town. There begins Alaba. But for you, this have to cross uh, the mountains of Salinas. The mountains of Russia are nothing compared to the slopes here. And to believe that our cars, in Basque called as French cars, are going to be able to climb those slopes is as ridiculous as thinking that we will be able to walk on the roof. But the miracle happened when an ox cart was tied to the horse cart. Never in all my life I, I heard such a noise. That impressive array of animals and humans created one of the most impressive effects I have ever witnessed. Um, there's much more. I, I just selected a few of them. <laughs> um, to, just to have in mind that when I was doing the research, I, I was not able to hear this sound. I mean, I, I was trying, I was calling farmers, etc. They were showing me cards, but no sound at all. The only sound I could get from was from this text. Finally, but not only, North American poet, writer, and musician Catherine Lee Bates. The peasant drives over the mountain roads in a ponderous ox cart with two clumsy discs of wood, and, of wood for wheels. The platform is wrought of rough hewn beams, five or seven, the middle one running forward to serve as pole. All the structure, except the iron tires and nails, is of wood, and the solid wooden wheels as the massive axle to which they are riveted turns over and over makes a most horrible squeaking. It is a sound dear to the peasantry, for they believe the oxen like it, and moreover, that it frightens away the devil. 
Okay, that's the, the, the description of, of Basque sounding uh, during 19th century. During um, on a few years ago, um, as we were working in an art art center now uh, disappeared in San Sebastian, we did a research uh, about noise and especially paying attention to the complaints of the neighbors of the San Sebastian, a very touristical city. Um, and um, to try to confront uh, uh, the lawyers with citizens and, uh, responsible of acoustic pollution in the town hall, etc. At the end, it didn't work very well. They, they, everybody was only, uh, they wanted only to talk about their own or the, the noise of the other. So one of the decalogue we did at the very end of the workshop was uh, meaning noise is always alien, always made by others. So when I read this text, I hear also tourists listening to noise while looking at the other, the alien, in Doppler effect. The missing words may call the rest. Noise is everything that has, that has no name, and vice versa, everything that has no name is noise. Noise is the unnameable to the ear, in short, the music of irrationality. The tourist from his geographical position, looking at the world as pure space, prioritizing the map to the territory, as Columbus did, believes he's the owner of the rationality, the truth. What happens here is not that he does not understand what he sees or hears, but he needs to maintain a distance from it. He needs to hear that noise, describe it as noise, to justify his position. It's just a question of class, sound as economical gap. Because who is really frightening in a way the devil? Who is that devil, by the way? The cowherd, the Oscar driver, he doesn't need the noise. They really do not. They rejoice in their supposed irrationality. An Oscar driver does not need a word to define his sound because he's already put in the body, and that's enough. A boyar, which is a sing that uh, in Brazil is uh, sung by uh, Oscar Driver, that's enough. When you sing, that's enough. America, in fact, was born as, an, uh, as a disembodied image, no registration required. It was born as a tourist continent, as a land with no place, and with inhabitants that suddenly became noise. For the colonialist, as far as for the, the contemporary tourist, it was necessary to build a brand new noise to name the unreason, a stick to measure the real absent image of a whole continent. Travelers, said Francisco de Paula Mellado, lie more than poets.
the Oscar, we can find the Oscar in all the colonies of uh, Portugal, but uh, also all the colonies in Spain. So somehow um, this um, this idea of, of a noise that all these travelers uh, uh, from the first world <laughs> were talking about, uh, and this gap, uh, this economical gap uh, related to this sound, uh, keeps alive thanks to the colonialism during centuries and centuries, even still now. Um, Rupert de Deutsch called it Plaustrum Stridens. Seneca names it as Stridor, when this sound provokes the very first noise laws in history, the Roman Empire. In Portuguese, a cart, shia, or you can even listen, o cantar do caro. It depends on which side of the ocean are listening. Don Quixote was imprisoned and humiliated in a carrochillon, a screaming cart. And in Basque language, the ox cart does not make noise. It cries, whistles, or squeaks. Giving names or giving a name to a noise means it will not be noise anymore. The name, in fact, is just a failure attempt to catch the noise we miss, of not accepting an absence because it reminds a shame whose shadow starts in the bronze air until now, where practically just in central Brazil can be heard. The question here is, who has decided and why when a sound becomes noise, so automatically adopts another status, becomes a tool to create hierarchies, levels, separations? As an epilogue, and I'm an ending, I found by chance this text, a letter published on a magazine in 1937, when almost the total, total of cards were disappeared in Basque Country, not only the Basque Country, but in all Europe. The text says like that. A few years ago, when the cards were multitude, the peasants used to move around giving concerts. There was a big tradition to compete among neighbors who, who could make the best sounds. Weddings, for instance, were good chances to make noise. There was always some who really had the technique, who knew how to make it sound better. You could call them and they would take the care of everything. It's the same when we see today gramophone discs. You need a singer, musicians, technicians. I remember my father telling me a story it happened to him. He used to work on a farm and the owner asked him as, and a friend to bring manure, manure, manure to San Sebastian. They didn't have enough for all the gardens of the city. They were forced to go almost at night. But as they approached and made the job faster than expected, they went to a barber shop. The barber man was a musician. He used to play violin. And that afternoon, he played to my father and friend. The friend asked to the violin player if he could take a small piece of a resin from him. He said yes. They took the cart. It was singing a lot. So policemen came suddenly screaming, shut up this card right now, he said, while stopping the card, I'm going to play violin now. So he did as he was adding grease to the wheels while he was adding resin. He took his stick and driving in his oxes, he woke up all the city while police were screaming as hell in vain. I don't know how they did it, but he told me they would make sound with the card just to wound the bag inside rich people's ears. A question of class, as we said.
Thank you.